This time on Pedalbox, we're working on the Golf, and we're going to install an OBD port because we don't know what's wrong with it. We need to know what's wrong with it, and really, I should have installed one of these quite a few years ago. Last time we worked on the Golf, it didn't go so well. Oh, fire! Let's see if we can avoid a fire this time. So this is the OBD port. It's fairly simple. In this case, there are two grounds, a positive and a signal. And that's all you need to wire in. All these are just extra ones because this was pulled out of another much more modern car which cares about more things. And with this installed, we can plug in a little OBD reader like this, uh, which you can then use for torque or any of the other applications that read OBD data on your phone. And you can get error information and all sorts of stuff. And there's a couple of problems with this overall. At the moment, it won't start, and we want to check whether or not the crank position sensor is working. So, by installing this, we can try and read the RPM through this, and if it reads nothing, that means the sensor is knackered. So this is the anatomy of your basic OBD port. The reader comes off, and you have 16 pins which run across here. Now, the ones we're interested in are pin 4 and 5, which are these two grounds. Now, on this one, it's actually labelled, although you're not going to be able to read it, but this bottom one is pin 1, so we have pin 4 and pin 5, which are both ground wires, pin 7, which is your signal line, and pin 16, which is power. And that's all we need to worry about, so these can stay out of the way. Now, to make our lives a little bit easier, we're going to install this using a Molex connector that you'd find in any given PC. This has four cables, or we will connect the two grounds together, and it means that we can remove this out of this car and put it in a different one should we ever need to. It also means we haven't got the connector dangling around while we're trying to dig around for wires, and we can actually relocate it to anywhere we like at a later date. So the Molex pins just get crimped onto the end of the cables, just go through like this, and then we crimp them, which I do really badly because I am actually terrible at electronics. And I would love to be able to show you this bit a bit better, but it's taking all of my dexterity just to operate this at the same time. So that's all four pins on now. We can now put them into our connector in any given order that we see fit. So now we have a conveniently made and built up connector that we can extend if we need to with a lot less faff than desoldering this from the car. So that finishes this connector. Now we need to put the other end of this onto the car loom so that we can plug this in. The cable we're really interested in down here is this little white and grey one that comes out underneath the fuse box from the main loom. Normally this would have a little brown plug on, but unfortunately mine's been lost, broken, fallen off or something at some point. But nevertheless, the cable itself is here. You can also trace this all the way back up to the ECU, which is just in front of the dashboard, and you'll be able to find it and you can do a continuity test to make sure you've got the right one. If you are going to trace this all the way back to the ECU, you want pin number 43 on the connector. So this is the pin that we need to connect onto what we're going to call pin 3, starting at this side. So this will be pin 1, pin 2, pin 3, and pin 4. This is the pin we need to connect onto pin 3 of our other end of the Molex adapter. Now, it's very easy to get this the wrong way around, at least for the first connector. Ask me how I know. So we've just put the plug into this end of the harness so we can check and make sure we get the grounds with the new ground wire. We put a quick splice into this so we have two ends and these just feed in through here and you just press them down gently like that of course they're going to spring back out bear with me so we've got the ends of the cable crimped down into here pushed all the way down in the plug and the cap fits over properly once you've done that the best thing to do is get the other end of your spool of wire connect one end of a multimeter up and put it on continuity mode and check all the way through that everything connects and it should beep Next up, we just trim the K-line down, put it in, and do exactly the same again. We can test continuity on the last one. All good. So we've just hooked this up a little bit hacky at the moment. We've got these wires that we've soldered onto the back running onto the battery that we've got connected up to the car. That just means we can test the link. So as we've powered this up, We've connected it to the phone, which is just a pairing operation. You just pair it like you would anything else. And we've loaded torque. Now we can load the fault code section just to see if it's connecting. And it's requesting fault codes from the ECU. And it's now downloading fault codes. So we know that this, the port, and everything else is connecting to the ECU. All being well, we should not have any errors on this, but you never know. 
So here we are, there are no fault codes stored in the ECU, which is excellent. And if we go on to real-time information, I'm just going to tuck this under here, because it's the best place I've got to do it. Uh, you can see on this dial, it is showing my throttle actuation as I push through, so we are getting something. And that means we can now turn this over and see whether we show any revs. And if we do, or don't, we can tell whether or not the crank position sensor is doing anything or nothing. There is nothing. Now the crank position sensor works because of the Hall effect. There's a magnet in here which generates a signal that's picked up by the ECU when the teeth of the flywheel go past it. Chris is taking the one that we put in when we thought that this was the problem with the car. So this is the one that was in the car previously and was working. So we're going to put that in and see if that works before we go and order a new one. So with the old sensor installed again, we can see whether or not we're registering any RPM. So we're showing revs. So we know that that sensor works, which is great. It's a little bit annoying that we took it off and put another DOF one on that then died, but whatever, we're now back to where we were about six months ago, although we have new plugs and leads on, so bonus. Testing the spark's pretty simple. We pop the plug out, leave the HT lead attached, we grab it through a nice big beefy pair of welding gloves so that I don't get electrocuted, and just see if we get a spark onto our metal inlet manifold here. Beautiful. So we know the ECU is getting signal. We know that we have spark in the cylinders. So we've plugged the pump back in, and we'll see whether it cranks over, and more importantly, whether it fires. Hey, this hasn't run in about eight months, but you probably can't hear me saying a lot of that right now. So good news, it runs again, and we were working it out. It's actually been 12 months since we last worked on this car and sent it for its MOT, and we did plugs, leads, a couple of the little bits, and it drove down and then died while it was there. It might not look like we've actually fixed anything. This is basically exactly as it was at the beginning of, well, last year when we when we did this, other than the, the plugs and the leads. What we've actually done in the background is check the ECU, because one thing it wasn't doing was energizing the throttle body, which you can hear is a bit of a hum when you start it up. So thanks go out to Matt from United Motorsports who popped around, fixed the ECU, and as it turns out, that, along with our swapped, then dodgy crank sensor, is actually the problem all along. But on the upside, it works. The only thing we need to do now is run our OBD2 port power and ground, because currently they run around over the front and are clipped onto the battery, and you can't really drive it like that. So we're going to find a couple of grounds and, uh, and some power cables back here, run them in, and then we have an OBD2 port as well. So at least that's further on than we have been, and I've been wanting that for about 10 years since I basically had this car, which is quite a long time to mess around and not put in three wires. It's it's a bit shameful, really. But yeah, good news. We'll get on with that, and hopefully this will be back on the road as soon as we can get it to an MOT station.